uh, to those that are reading this phenomenal epistle. And so we are going to this morning look really at the very first proof that we are Christians. The very first proof that we are Christians. There, I don't know that there's a particular order in which the Holy Spirit guided uh, John to be able to share these things I kind of think that he did there's a reason why uh, these are laid out the way they are but this is the first one that John is going to share with us here this morning and we actually have a children's song that kind of fits very much with this particular uh, proof and that is obedience is the very best way to show that you believe how many know that little song obedience is the very best way to show that you believe and uh and that really is what john is going to uh share with us uh here this evening so if you're there you could stand with me please as we read a handful of verses out of chapter 2 first john chapter 2 we're going to begin in verse 3 just reading about three or four verses here this morning this evening the bible says this and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected hereby know we that we are in him he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked our heavenly father i pray that you'd bless the time that we have in your word here this evening we ask lord that you'd open our hearts to understand and to comprehend that which the holy spirit has for us father certainly there is no greater assurance in life than to have the assurance that heaven will be our home someday father we do believe that once we have placed our faith and trust in the lord jesus christ we have eternal life Father, that nothing can take that away. Father, there are many that still struggle with assurance of that eternal security. I pray, Father, that through the course of this evening, uh, some things will be settled. One way or the other, those that hear my voice would be able to study with us the Holy Scriptures and come to some definite conclusions about their own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to determine if they are truly in Him if they truly have evidence and proof that they are children of God. And Father, we pray that you would be honored in our service here this evening, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we begin to look at this very first proof, uh, we're going to identify several things that I would encourage you to jot down and, and to mark maybe in your Bible as they relate to this first proof of eternal life the fact that we are children of god and we know that heaven is going to be our home someday uh, as i pointed out i think last sunday when we go into first john there's some things that are helpful to understand john is going to use some very definitive and very uh very poignant language uh, he is not going to equivocate he is not going to in any way uh, gloss over things or uh, soften the edges he is going to be very clear and he's going to be very precise in what he is saying what happens however is that we look at his words and we begin to think well wait a minute for example uh, he says that if you are a Christian you don't sin well I sin so I must not be a Christian well I explained last Sunday that there is a use in the verbiage the grammar there of a particular tense in the Greek language uh, that helps us to understand some things about what John is saying. John is not saying that a Christian simply never sins. Sinless perfection is not possible in this life. Now that's not to say that we should not pursue it and that we should not see progress in victory over sin because the Holy Spirit is within us and certainly we should have victory over sin and can continue to see that pattern. But he is saying that a Christian does not continue a pattern of sin without consequence. That there's got to be consequence, there's got to be conviction, there's got to be a recognition that I am miserable, that things are not right, uh, a frustration, if you will. He does not continue in that pattern 
unafflicted by these things. That's what he is saying. Well, it is also true with obedience. Uh, There's not a Christian on the face of the earth that does not at one point or another disobey the Heavenly Father. Uh, The commandments are there for us and the wherewithal to keep those commandments are there, but we are made of weak stuff. The Apostle Paul himself said in Romans chapter 7, there are things that I know I should do in order, in other words, I should obey, but I don't. Uh, there are some things that I know I shouldn't do. In other words, obey. But I do. So even the Apostle Paul uh, makes it clear that we want to obey God, we strive to obey God, and we often do obey God, but there are going to be times that we, we fail, that we do not obey as we should. So when we look at this particular passage, uh, and he says something like he did in this passage that, if you do not keep his commandments, you're a liar. Uh, let's understand, if any of you have here today alone broken one of his commandments, don't consider yourself lost. Let's look at the pattern. Let's see. Is obedience the norm for me, or is it an exception? When I feel spiritual, do I obey, and otherwise I don't obey, and I have no compunction, no conviction? That is really what we're talking about here in this particular passage let's begin with the very first observation and that is that obedience is a fundamental principle of the new life in verse 3 he says hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments John makes this a very uh, signal point of the Christian experience he says this is one way we can know that we are in Him, that we know Him. That is by keeping His commandments. Very simple, very basic principle. Where there is new life, there is new living. When Jesus Christ comes in and we experience the regeneration, the new birth, there is going to be new life habit patterns, new behavior. My life is going to show a change because that is a fundamental principle of the new life. He says we know that we are uh, in a relationship with Him because we are going to be keeping His commandments. Many of us have a testimony to that effect, particularly those that might have been saved a little bit later in life. Uh, You noted a difference in your life. You're not saying that you were perfect. Uh, you're not even saying that you are a, were a rank sinner before you were saved. You just knew you were a sinner. But you do know that after you came to Christ, some changes happened in your life. You began to notice that you had different affections and different interests and that, and that a desire to obey the commandments of God was all of a sudden there when maybe it had not been there before. That is a key principle the apostle paul told the corinthians he says in second corinthians chapter 5 if any man be in christ he is a what a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new and so we are new creatures and because we are new creatures we have a new uh new dynamic uh a new paradigm of our life And our course has been charted by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that we are always going to be true to that calling. There are going to be times when we fail in that calling. The Apostle Paul, as he wrote to the the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, he said, listen, we have a calling in Christ Jesus that we really need to honor and to respect. He would not have said that if the Corinthian church was already living that way. He said that because they were not living that way. They were not being obedient to God's commandments in so many different ways. And so he said, listen, this is a fundamental principle of the Christian experience. If I receive Christ as my Savior, it is natural and expected that my life is going to change. He says, hereby we know that we know Him because we keep His commandments. Again, we may not be perfect in it, 
but that is going to be the trajectory of our life. The second thing that John, I think, points out is found in the next verse. He says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He is saying at this point, not only is obedience a fundamental principle of the Christian experience, it is also tangible proof, tangible proof of the Christian experience. I have found in my, my years of ministry that one of the most significant culprits when it comes to people doubting their salvation is that they cannot identify proof because their life does not emulate Jesus Christ. They have not made a habit of being obedient. Now, I never try to make somebody a Christian who is not a Christian. We need to settle the matter of a profession of faith, a repentance of sin, a, re a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once that has been assured and settled, then we begin to look at, okay, what kind of habit patterns have we formed? Is it, are they patterns where we are actively seeking to obey God's commands or are we actually disobeying his commands and if we're disobeying commands are you aware that you are disobeying is there conviction and generally speaking they say yes there are things that I know I should be doing and I and I start and then I fail and I get discouraged and why is that because obedience is the acid test of Christianity it is the genuine test to see, is this real? Am I real? One of the, uh, one of the things uh, that I like to do is um, we might get out some nice dinnerware and glassware and things like that, uh, and uh, maybe for special company or maybe your holiday season, and we'll get these crystal goblets that you put out for your sparkling cider and you know and you make a special function for thanksgiving or christmas or something like that and i like to take them by the stem and i like to take my finger and kind of ding now that's crystal right if it was just glass it would go clunk but you go bing you get that little ring sound and that's the test it says bing it rings true uh it is crystal and Obedience is that little, that little bing. It says, I do know the Lord as my Savior. It is the tangible proof. When people look at my life, uh, they can see the difference in how I live my life. In, uh, you don't need to turn there, but in John chapter 14, the Gospel of John, John chapter 14, Jesus Christ uh, makes reference to the importance of obedience actually um, a couple times. But in chapter 14 and in verse 15, he says this, if ye love me, keep my commandments. He says this is the acid test. You say you love me. You say that you are devoted to me, dedicated to me. That you uh, are allegiant with me. And that you want to be my disciple. Well, prove it. Prove it by obeying my commandments. Let that be the proof that you need. And so I would again lay this out as an encouragement for us as Christians. Not only is it important to recognize that if we name the name of Jesus Christ, uh, it is only uh, natural that we are going to see a change in our life but also to go a step further and say, listen, obedience is a proof that I do belong to Him. It's a proof that I love Him. It's a proof that I belong to Him. John says, if we don't see that, if you don't see that, then you're actually lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. Um, you are defrauding yourself by pretending that you are something that you are not. Religion feeds that kind, of a, that kind of a lifestyle. Because religion is predicated upon a list of do's and don'ts, and 
uh, we often try to enter into a bargain arrangement where I, I will uh, maybe fail a few places over here, but I will make up for it over on this side over here. Um, from a uh, spiritual standpoint, that does not work with God, just as like, just like um, the global warming nuts are when they say we need to uh, get carbon credits. You see, you see, I'm going to... I'm going to pollute over here, but if I if I spend money over here uh, for a clean energy so that somebody else can do, then that will kind of offset the pollution. It, it just it's ludicrous. It's stupid. Um, but, you know, you're dealing oftentimes with stupid people. Um, but in the religious realm, it's the same way that, you know, well, I know that I kind of screwed up over on this end. But I'll make up for it over here. And in the end, God will balance everything out. Obedience doesn't take a holiday. Doesn't take a vacation. It is the proof that we are His. It's a tangible evidence that we belong to Him. In verse 5, John says this. He says, but whoso keepeth His word, that means obey his commandments in him verily is the love of god perfected perfected hereby know we that we are in him john says that the that obedience then becomes a reliable path to greater intimacy with the lord something that i noticed when I was preparing the message and, and studying this passage in verse 3, he says, Hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. But in verse 5, he takes this concept of knowing the Lord even deeper. He's saying obedience becomes a gateway to greater intimacy with the Lord. It's not just a matter of just doing what you're told and being a good person, a good Christian. It actually opens up this does in our relationship that we would not have otherwise the the analogy i have is with my own children i love my children intensely when they were obedient our relationship was very free-flowing and open and there really was, the sky was the limit in so many ways. But when there was disobedience, there was a restriction. It didn't mean that I loved them less, but it meant that the open flow, the interaction was now restricted. There were some issues that needed to be resolved. And that's the same way it is in the Christian experience. That if I withhold obedience from the Lord, it is going to stunt my spiritual growth. But... If I'm obedient, it is going to open things up so that I can reach higher plateaus in my relationship. I wanted you to see this. In verse 3, I mentioned that we know Him by our obedience. But in verse 5, it says we know that we are in Him. We are in Him. There's an intensity that is brought about by obedience. Not just that we know Him, but that we are actually in Him. We are finding from our relationship all that we need to grow and to thrive. And notice also what he says there in verse 5. Through this medium, the love of God is perfected. You see, as we saw earlier this morning, God has prepared so much for those that love Him. But we miss out on those things because we do not cultivate and encourage the mind of Christ. We don't think the way He would have us to think. We think upon this level here, the earthly level. We, we mind earthly things and material things. And so much of the richness and the deepness of God's love is, is gone unclaimed. Well, He's saying here, by obedience... The love that God would pour out upon us is accentuated. It is magnified. It is perfected. It comes to a completion, a full fruition 
in our life through that obedience. Obedience becomes the path to being able to experience greater connectivity with our Heavenly Father. Uh, to be able to see our spiritual life flourish as perhaps it never has flourished before. Maybe if we find ourselves being stunted, being uh, left on the sidelines, maybe it's because we've not been obedient to the Lord. My wife and I, with this beautiful weather, have been wanting to see our flowers grow and plant new flowers and get things going. And uh, we had planted some hydrangeas a couple years ago. They were beautiful when we put them in. We put them in, I mean, just a perfect place. I mean, the new soil and, and mulch and all was like that deep. I mean, it was a perfect place. And uh, the color drained from the hydrangeas. It became a sepia look. And then all last year, not a single blossom, not a single blossom. This year, we're beginning to see life. And we love it. We love it. And it's a whole lot easier to pour love upon these things, you know, making sure that they get all the fertilizer, they get all the water they need because we want to coax them to blossom. And the Lord is the same way. He wants to see us flourish in His love. But there needs to be obedience. Until there's obedience, we really will not truly experience the depth and the richness of the love that God would give to us. Because God does not waste that intimacy upon those that are not interested. Those that do not appreciate what He would give to them. It's not that He loves us less. It's that we restrict, we shut off that love by being disobedient. And so, obedience is the pathway. Reliable pathway. Uh, to greater intimacy. It, it takes us from simply knowing that we are His to actually experiencing what it's like to be in Him. To find our very existence tied inextricably with our Heavenly Father. Then verse 6, John writes, He that saith he abideth in Him, Ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. The final thought that I would share with you here is that from John's perspective, obedience is a reasonable pattern for the Christian. It's a reasonable pattern for the Christian. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what service? Your reasonable service. It's only reasonable, given what He has done for us, that we would reciprocate, that we would render to Him obedience and service that is commensurate with what He has done for us. It's only reasonable that we would do that, that we would give ourselves a living sacrifice for Him. Uh, Peter makes it very clear. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. Peter says, as a matter of fact, we can take a look. Why don't we take a look there? Go to 1 Peter, or yeah, 1 Peter chapter 1. Keep your finger here. Just flip over. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 15. He says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And he's quoting out of the book of Leviticus there. Leviticus, and of course we know that Leviticus is a book dedicated to the expectations of the law and the patterns of the sacrificial system. But Peter is making the observation that it is only, it is only a reasonable pattern that we should expect. If, if God is holy and we know Him, then we're going to be holy too. We're going to want to be as He is. I think it's a wonderful thing that children as they grow want to emulate their parents. As long as their parents' example is a good one. That they want to be like mom or like dad. 
It says, I respect you. I love you. I like who you are. I want to be like you. And that really is a pattern that is natural. It's logical. It's very basic to be able to say, my God is holy. I know Him. I want to be like Him. I want to be holy too. I want to live my life in a way that pleases Him. So John says this in verse 6. He saith, he that uh, saith he abideth in Him. I mean, if you, if you know that you are in Him through obedience, it is only natural that you would want to walk like He did. To live like Jesus Christ did. To emulate and to pattern your life after Jesus Christ. And to show that by that simple, simple example, that simple imitation, that you are a child of God. That the obedience goes all the way through and that you are able to see the value of emulating the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if, he, if we abide in Him, we ought ourselves also so to walk. That, it's natural. There, there's a, a pattern that has been cut by Jesus Christ, and we, you know, like a child trying to walk in the steps of their grown up, their parents in deep snow, it's like those are kind of deep, and we step in. But you know, the beautiful thing about it is that God never expects of us what we cannot do in His power, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to be able to step in those steps. Yes, sometimes we're going to stumble and fall down. Sometimes we need to be picked up and dusted off. But there should be a pattern within our heart that says, I want to be like Him. That's what I want to be like. I want to be like Jesus. So John says the very first proof of salvation is obedience. It really is the very best way to show that you believe. Obedience provides us the fundamental principle of the new life. It's only natural. New life, new living. Obedience is the tangible proof that we are His child. Something we can see. It is the reliable path to greater intimacy with the Lord. And finally, it is a reasonable pattern that really anyone should expect. And so my prayer is that everyone here has that assurance. No, I'm not perfect. No, I don't always obey as I ought. Sometimes I do not do the things that I know I should. But the Holy Spirit makes it clear. Sometimes I do the things I know I should not do. Again, the Holy Spirit makes it clear. But by God's grace, my desire is to obey His commandments. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that You'd bless as we close our service tonight. Grateful for being in the house of the Lord, and we pray that You would use Your Word to continue to encourage each and every believer. And Father, for those that might hear this message that they might ask themselves this question. Does my life prove that I am a child of God? Is there indeed obedience to your commandments? And Father, if that evidence is not there, I pray that they would settle the matter even tonight. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.